worship Christ the King. Alleluia, amen. Praises to him we bring. Alleluia, amen. With grateful heart and voice, before his throne rejoice. Praise is his gracious choice. Alleluia, amen. Um, kids on fire, come on up. Good morning, good morning. Thank you, Trudy. How are you? Good. Good? Oh, wait. Hurry. There's more people there. coming. There are. There are, there are. Look, more people. Awesome. Hi. What's How are you? the plate for? What's the plate for? What plate? Oh. Well, I brought I brought you a present this morning. What is it? You don't see it? No, a plate. Oh. Something happened to it. I brought you a brownie. So maybe you should look around on the stage up there and see if you can find the brownie. There's a brownie around here somewhere. You found it? No, there's two brownies. Three three brownies. Four, five, six. What? I brought one brownie. What is this? Not to miss anything. I think you found them. Yeah, I know you found them. Bring them on over. You put them on the plate. Okay, way to go. Come on, Monty, bring it over here and put it on the plate. Um, you don't want to eat that, I guess. Do you want it? I want it. You do? I want it. Well, I'll tell you what, it, it, it really was a brownie. I'll tell you what, we'll just squish it together. There we go. Now we got a brownie. No. No? You don't want to eat it now? What, because my hands were on it? I want to eat it now. Your hands were already on it. <laughs> Who said that? Was that Monty? Matthew or Monty said that. I barely caught it. You really want that now? You know what that is? I want that It's the scraps. We're going to talk about the way some people gather scraps together and they try to make something out of them today. You'll listen for that this morning during the sermon, okay? Not today. Yeah, okay. Listen well. I'll see you later. Thanks for coming up. I love that song. Appreciate it. Uh, fits very well with our text this morning. Um, I told you last week, uh, I can't want to is the, a phrase that uh, belovedly I, one of my grandchildren said when they were very young. When they were asked to do something by their parents, they said, I just can't want to. And uh, it didn't work, but it, it has provided a lot of chuckles since then. Um, but that's really where it starts, and uh, I've, we've been looking at the subject of sin for several weeks, and the passage I want to take us back to, I showed you last week, James chapter 1 is, is kind of the basis for this uh, part of our series, because I want us to, to stay in the right place. We so quickly go to the blame game where sin is concerned. James says, chapter 1, each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So that phrase that we use when we say, you made me, uh-uh. I may have provided you an opportunity, but you went there all by yourself. So you, you have to keep in mind, when temptation comes our way, we tend to want to look outside. We tend to want to say, what's out there that's making me think this? And the reality is that, that thinking that was in there all along, it's just uh, been given a place and we uh, are giving into it. So our text this morning is going to be Romans chapter 13. And, and the songs on love, uh, I, I told Doug I was going to talk about sin. He says, well, I'm going to sing on love. I said, no, that's really my text. But uh, uh, it's really, really the same sort of thing. Romans 13 verses... Uh, 8, uh, 9, and 10. 
owe no, uh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in the saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now here's, here's the conclusion. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, I probably will say this more than once this morning. But it's important for us to understand the, the law, the commands, as you saw, were all negatives. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But often, when we get caught doing something we're not supposed to do, it's because we're not doing something we're supposed to do. And that is, if we focus on love, Paul says we won't do those things. So we, ch we turn our focus, we, we change our minds, repentance, we, we look a different way for what will make us strong. And what makes us strong is not that we're not supposed to do things. What makes us strong is love. And that's the first, or, uh, it's the first and the second commandment. Love your neighbor is the second commandment. Now, a love that would do no wrong toward a neighbor, where do you get that exactly? Oh, you, you sang another song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. In fact, two or three songs. We, we've sung about this all morning. We get this, and Romans 5, 5 has this very simple statement. And honestly, I'm in the middle of a sentence, but this part of it. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We love because He first loved us, John says. We love because God poured into our hearts a love that's not like the way we would try to love. It's better. Sometimes we love, but we love selfishly. I love as long as you love me. I love as long as you treat me exactly the way I want to be treated. But when the going gets tough, or as Jesus says, when our enemies appear, the answer is still love. Love your enemies, Jesus said. So the love of God has been poured into our hearts. That's the basis on which we can love our neighbor. And if you haven't noticed, sometimes our neighbor doesn't act right. It's still the command. It's still what we are to do. Now, love does no wrong. I want to I look at a passage with you that actually goes with what I talked about last week. But I want to show you how these are linked together. We talked last week about immorality. We actually looked at the example of David. But immorality is not just a sin against ourselves, as Paul says in Corinthians. It always also involves a sin against someone else. And so Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, again in the middle of a thought, but this is the cream of what he's saying here. We're not supposed to act in lustful passion like Gentiles who don't know God. And, and Paul says that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger of these things as we told you before and solemnly warned you. Now, what the subject of 1 Thessalonians 4 is that we be sexually pure and that we possess our vessel in sanctification and honor. That, those are the verses ahead of this. And to transgress that defrauds our brother. So when, when we look out and, and we decide we're going to act out of our desires, we're going to do what we want in spite of what God says, we, we give in to our passions. We are not just hurting ourselves, we are also defrauding someone else. And that may depend, who that is may depend on different situations. But it's not the only sin that causes harm to other people. In fact, I want to kind of focus on a section of, of the sin passages that's in all of the sin passages. I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's kind of interesting. It's at the end of the chapter. And Paul's talking about being afraid to come to, 
the uh, Corinthians because, you know, he's been pretty tough with them about what they ought to be doing, and they're not doing it all. So he says, I'm afraid, perhaps when I come to you, I may find you to be not what I wish, and I may be found by you to be not what you wish. That perhaps there will be strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. You take all those together and you've got one big mess. Any one of them destroy. Paul says, I don't want to come to the church there and, and this is the atmosphere. All of those kind of things. And then he says, I'm afraid that when I come to you again, my God may humiliate me more before you. I may mourn over many of those who have sinned in the past and not repented of the impurity, immorality, and sensuality which they practice. Now you see these two kinds of sin in this passage? We're going to focus on the first verse, but here's what we talked about last week. Paul in, in chapter 5 says, you know, you're harboring immorality among yourselves and you're kind of proud of it. And, and in that context and several others, fundamentally what's being talked about is sexual sin. Immorality is kind of a blanket word that talks about a lot of ways we are immoral in a sexual way. But it involves other things, as we mentioned. Not only did David uh, commit adultery with Bathsheba, he defrauded Uriah, his mighty man, his good friend, by taking his wife for himself and then taking Uriah's life. So the, the, the sexual sin just was an opportunity for a lot of other sin to be manifest. And so immorality does harm to self and to others, as I've said. And then there's this second word that's in a lot of the passages. And again, it's kind of a summary word. It's the word impurity. Now we tend to go uh, to the sexual arena for that. That's, that's really not what's being talked about. He's already covered that. Impurity is the word that's used in the Old Testament for uncleanness, like a leper would be, or like someone who's touched a dead body and doesn't need to be around until they're cleansed ceremonially. And so if you're impure, you're not fit to be around other people. Well, that's the way we are when we talk and act and behave impurely. It's actually used of something as simple as perjury or lying when we're lying, we're not, we're not holding on to the pure truth, right? And, it, and, and that's a word that can be used uh, uh, for impurity is lying. It's being ungodly or unloving or hurtful. And, and again, this is more what we talked about last week, but I want to lay these things in relief with us because that's part of it. But Paul in all of the sin lists and others who, who say, you know, don't be like this. There's always this section of sins. Now, I'm, these words are, are mostly going to come from Galatians 5 when we read about the works of the flesh. I'm going to borrow one from the, the Romans, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians passage that we read earlier. But let's, let's look at three or four of these and, and really what's involved. The first way that, that we do wrong to one another in, in this list, I'm going to use the word enmity. Enmities. Now, the reason I'm using that word is because it is almost identical to the word enemy in Greek. And, it, and those two things go together. So enmity is how enemies act with each other. Okay? That, that goes together. That's how you can remember that. It's basically hostility. Two people who are enemies get near each other and there's bristling and, and trouble in the room and in the atmosphere. There is hostility. We see in our world, and, and, th and this is straight out of the commentary. This is interesting to me. First thing they mention is politics. Commentary is decades old. Hey, it's been around since the beginning of time, folks. Didn't start two years ago. Politics, race, and religion. These are ways people are hostile to each other. Always has been. And, and, and so when they get hostile and bristly in attitude then actions start in, and we're going to see some of those actions in the rest of the list. But enmities is a kind of a, a, an atmosphere that happens around people who are not getting along and who are acting like enemies, and the primary manifestation of that is hostility. 
A second word that is used in, in Galatians is the word strife. It's used in several of the lists. Strife. The god, a goddess, I should say, Eris, this is the Greek word, they, they actually named a goddess after the word strife. The goddess of war and destruction. Oh, don't you want to be that? Yeah. So imagine if your religion has a goddess for this sort of thing. You can imagine how hard it's going to be to keep people out of this. This is, this is quarrelsome. Hostility leads to quarreling, arguing, always finding an issue that, that we don't agree about. And it goes with another of the words, and that's outbursts of rage. You know, when, when, when you've got hostility, it simmers, and, and, and it boils, and then an opportunity presents itself, and there's an explosion. It's not because something happened that caused the explosion. It's because it's been simmering and boiling, and there's an opportunity. And so an outburst isn't a sudden thing at all. An outburst has been going on for a long time. And it just boils up because there's an opportunity to express it. So strife is, is a sin that Paul identifies that, that is akin to war. It causes destruction. And, and it comes in this package called quarrelsome. And it's not what we want to be. It's just not. It hurts people. Now three seems uh, innocent. <laughs> it's not. Some of these words actually can go either way. In other words, they could be a good thing, they could be a bad thing. We looked at one of those last week. Envy is not one of those. Envy is when you can't stand it when someone else prospers. Enmity is when you can't stand it that your friend got the promotion. I can't stand it that you can get a new car and I can't. I can't stand it. You see, the, you see the base of it? I can't stand it. Now, it goes with jealousy. And again, jealousy can be good or bad. But, but jealousy that comes from envy is the motive behind the crucifixion. It was for envy that they delivered him up, the text says. Basically, they didn't like how Jesus had the crowds and they didn't. They didn't like how Jesus could command everyone's love and affection and they couldn't. And he would teach, and thousands would come, and they would teach, and nothing would happen. And they began to, to be envious, and it boiled and boiled and boiled and festered, and they finally had to kill him. And so again, one sin leads to another, but these are, these are sort of some of the attitudes that, that bring that out. And so envy hurts people. Does it hurt the moment you envy? No, not necessarily. I mean, you may be hurting yourself now, but since this is one of those things that's going to fester, that hurt is going to spread and cause trouble. The fourth one I want to look at with you is, is I'm going to use the word dissension out of the list. Dissension is, is uh, well, fundamentally, it's, it's mercenary rivalry. I'm, I feel a rivalry with you for someone else. <laughs> you know, and it's what we do in politics. I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican, so this is how I'm supposed to talk to you. We get our script from somewhere else, but we feel the rivalry nonetheless. And, and that's why there's arguments and dissension. Uh, the word dispute and the word division are on each side of this. And, and those all go together. We, we dispute. We say, that's not true. That's a lie. You're lying. You know, when you're talking like that, you're getting awful close to sin here. And, and what that leads to is division. And so I'm this and you're that, and, then, and the two shall not meet. And then what that will lead to is the full-blown enemy. I'm totally always going to be your enemy. And this is going to divide friendships. It's going to divide churches. It's going to divide homes. It's going to, you know, divide countries. Dissension is sort of any or all of those things. And so the word factions or parties, and I don't mean that in the sense of birthday party. I mean that in the sense of political party. Parties, sects, as in sections, those that believe this and those that believe that, and they're divided. It's actually the word choice. <laughs> I choose this when you chose that one, we're, we're angry with each other. And, and that's, that's the word picture from this word dissension. Now, the, 
the last one I want to talk about is, is gossip. It was actually in the 2 Corinthians list. And what's interesting to me is that gossip is where we take dissension and factions and strife and enmity. We take it to gossip. Now, I'm going to talk real plain. And if you're not ready for that, please get there. Gossip is talking to someone who can't solve the problem. You say, I I don't understand that. Well, it's when we whisper and we slander or we accuse or we impugn someone's motives, but we don't do it to them to say, you're sinning, stop doing this. We do it to their friends so they'll stop being their friend. Division. We do it to the elders so that they'll fire the preacher. Threats. We gossip not to the person who can solve the problem. We don't tell the boss we don't like the program. We go tell the receptionist with our cup of coffee. And we stand around and talk about how stupid the boss is. The receptionist can't fire the boss. We're we're wasting our time here. We're telling someone who can't fix the problem. Now, there are a lot of word pictures for gossip in the Bible, but one of them was the one I showed the kids this morning. Picking up the scraps. And do you know what the word picture really means? It ain't brownies. It's buzzards. Buzzards who pick up dead scraps. Yeah, that's what you're doing. You like that? You like working in those scraps of dead flesh that you can make into something? You can try to bring it back to life. You can take an action that, was, that actually happened that's true. But you can bring it back to life. And somebody could get in trouble. Or someone could think badly toward the person you're mad at. Not the person who can fix it now. Someone else. And so how damaging this is. I put Dave Ramsey on here because... I. I was blown away in my Facebook feed this week. He actually sponsored this. I think I joined his group of facilitators, and so I got some things from him. But he has a little section in his uh, leadership series where he talks about gossip. And I did not know this about Dave Ramsey as many years as I followed him. Dave Ramsey is a, is a coveted employer. Working for Dave Ramsey is good stuff. He pays well. He, he is behind you all the way. He gives good benefits. And he is a very successful businessman, so you've got some pretty good job security. But when you are employed by Dave Ramsey, you get one warning. You gossip, and you're gone. I will not tell you the words he uses. It's coarser than I talk. You are gone. You are fired summarily for saying one word thing that is gossipy after you've been warned. You were warned when you were hired, you get one warning by the receptionist or whoever you try it with, you're gone. You have no job. That's how, and you know why? Not because Dave Ramsey's a Christian, he believes everybody should act like a Christian. Because gossip kills companies and he doesn't want his to die. Period. That's it. That's his entire reason. That's what he says. I've been on the bad end of this so many times, I get emotional thinking about it. I've lost jobs because someone thought that if they just told somebody something, it wouldn't hurt anybody. It did. It ends careers. Now, what do you do when a gossip comes up to you? You can't fire them. (laughs) You might want to, but you can't. Here's a question that you can ask. What did they say when you asked them about this? What do you think you're going to hear if you ask this question? Well, I, actually, I haven't talked to him yet. Oh. What does that tell you? I'm talking to someone who can't do anything about the problem. So what is your goal? Except to hurt someone. And you know a second word that's put with gossip in Scripture? Malicious gossips. It's, it's, it explains what gossip does. It's out of malice, it's out of hatred, hostility, that we talk about someone who can't solve the problem. It it doesn't make any sense. 
So here's, here's a principle that will do us well. If a gossip comes to you to talk and you ask the question, what did they say, and they haven't talked to them, if they're not willing to be named, quoted, or go with you, they need to be heard as a gossip. Now the hard part about this is it's pretty hard to be judgmental to other people when we do it. Huh. Oh, that one stings. You know why I hate gossip so much? Because I can be pretty good at it. We, we do that with sin. You know, the one we can't stand in other people is the one we commit, and the reason we see it and understand it so well is because it flows out of us so easily. That's the problem of hypocrisy. That's something else we have to deal with. But gossip is stopped when we say, let's go deal with this. You think this occurred and it shouldn't occur, then let's go and let's ask this person why they did this. Let's ask them if that's the way Christ taught them to act. Let's ask them what they're going to do about it. Let's give them the opportunity to fix it. Now, where we started with this whole thing was love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. But what's interesting is Paul says love is actually the solution in the sense that if we use love as our rule of living, then we won't do those things. So not only is it defined as not doing wrong, but that's how not to do wrong to a neighbor. It's to love them. So in Ephesians 5, Paul says, walk in love. Walk in it. As Christ loved you and gave Himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God is a fragrant aroma. But immorality or impurity or greed must not even be named among us, as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, no immoral or impure or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So you see how Paul just puts all those things back in the same basket again? The, the, the things we were talking about today kind of summarize in this screen and the immorality, impurity, and, and uh, covetousness in the other. Now if you look at this slide, <laughs> it's kind of chilling. Because I just described, you know, enmity and factions and, you know, some really big, heavy-duty stuff. Silly, talk, coarse joking, if you will, coarse joking. Is that filthiness? You know, filthy mouth? You see how Paul takes those things and puts them right in there with the same enmities and strife and division and all those heavy-duty hard ones. Gossip. You see, when we're spending our time joking around, but, but everything that we say has an edge on it, and it's, just, it's either offensive or it's right on the edge of offensive. We're trying to get a rise out of someone. We're trying to make someone look bad. And so we, you know, we do something really hurtful, and then we say, I was kidding. No, you weren't. That's why it just came out so quickly. You know, that's been simmering in there too. So he takes these things and he says, you know, I'm going to put that with immoral and impure and covetous, and I'm going to tell you, none of that belongs among saints, and none of that will be in the kingdom. This isn't the way God set up His church to operate. This isn't something He's going to tolerate. And, and if you don't weed it out, He will. You, you can't take your gossipy scrap of truth that you want to define someone's entire life by to the judgment seat of God and get Him to be on your side. When you tell God that, you know, you hated this person because this, I mean, this fact right here, I can tell you why. This is why I hate this person. And He looks at you and He says, I don't remember what you're talking about. Now what are you going to say? You just put your whole salvation on the line for a piece of scrap? Gossip? That he doesn't even remember? Because he forgave it. That makes no sense. It won't fly. There's not going to be an inheritance if that's what we intend to take and offer to God as righteousness. I, 
harming other people has its own negative. It also, the, the possibility of harming is its own prevention. Yeah. Let me give you a couple of things that kind of help us out at a time like this. If you're having impure thoughts, put a different thought in there. You're about to harm someone. Remember that this person that you're having impure thoughts about is someone else's daughter. You know, if, if we had a national leader who saw an intern as someone to play with in the office, if he could have just thought, but wait a minute, someone sent their daughter to Washington. And I'm harming not this person only, but that person too. Not to mention the nation. We might be in a whole different place today talking about immorality and politics. It's that reminder, I don't want to do harm to someone else. I want to show love to this person. Instead of spreading that piece of gossip, I want this person to be redeemed. I'll bet they didn't mean to do this. I'll bet this is something they won't stand behind as something that's right and good. And we can nip this and it'll go away and the church will be purer for it. That's love. Gossiping to someone else is hate. So we use love as the way not to do the sin. That's what makes it work, Paul says. My question this morning is, what have you done to cause harm? I'm going to step out on a limb here and suggest that there's not an innocent person among us. And if you're sitting there trying to justify yourself and saying, well, really, I haven't hurt anybody. The verses after the text I read says, don't be deceived by empty words. Because that's the temptation. We've got to deal with the harm we cause other people. We've got to be willing to make it right. And we've got to go to the place where the good can be done. First to the throne of God for forgiveness. And second to the person who's been wronged for forgiveness again. And then it's healed. And then it goes away. It never goes away if you don't heal it. What will you do today? Is our invitation as we stand and sing. Come worship Christ the King. Hallelujah. Amen.